And in terms of Toronto and the arts in Canada and the arts, it was a time of trying to get the critical mass going and convince the commercial community that, and the public uh, community that really the arts are a good investment. How was, how was that atmosphere to deal with? Because you came to Toronto in the late 50s. Well, we came in 59. And uh, we had three children. And I said, well, since I'm coming to a Never Never Land from New York, I probably won't get a job because everything was very British at that time. TV, radio, and the theater too. And since I had a New York accent and I didn't think I'd ever manage to have a British accent, I didn't think I'd get a job anyway. So I said to, to Jan, I'll look after the kids until they go to school. And once they go to school, I'm going to do something else. Preferably uh, uh, run a children's theater. Uh, <clears throat> to go back uh, to New York, the only children's theater in New York at the time was at the 92nd Street Y, which did wonderful things. But the performances for children were abominable. And Annie Jackson and I used to take at that time, we each had two kids. We didn't have the third one. And we used to say, this is such awful stuff. We should really start a theater for children and do some wonderful performances for children, which we never did, because Annie was uh, working a lot in the theater and didn't have time. And uh, I was still working a lot in the theater. So, and in TV, and so these were sort of things we talked about, but never did anything about it. So when I got to Toronto and looked after the children and wasn't going to be acting, uh, I thought, well, this is a chance to see what we could do. And did you find the, the very kind of let's be British attitude uh, like a closed shop? As you said, you had a New York accent and didn't feel you could get work. Well, I mean, I vaguely remember the feeling when I started that only British theater was real theater and right. the American theater, they were very interesting, but that was all that song and dance yeah, stuff. Yeah. That if you wanted to be real theater, you had to have a bit of a, and there was the mid-Atlantic accent which crept right, in. Right. Um, and it was strange when people like Michael Langham started saying to the Stratford actors, uh, cut the North Atlantic accent, speak with your own voice. Yeah. So what did it feel like uh, as an outsider to come well, in? Well, uh, <clears throat> I did some work in New York when I came here. For, uh, and there were some American directors, who, TV directors, who came to Toronto. And they did, uh, they did work for the US, but it was shot here. I don't quite know why, but it was shot uh, at, uh, where were we shooting? Somewhere where CTV is now, mm -hmm. CFTO. There was something. Right. So I did a few things for the directors who came and knew I was here. So that was kind of fun. Did I you audition for Stratford? Did you audition for uh, the Royal Alex? No. And actually, uh, uh, I did some radio for S.A. Young, who knew me from radio from New York. Right. So he gave me some radio work. And then when he took over the TV, he said to me, I'll get something for you to do. And I did one TV show. One? One. <laughs> For the CBC. Which was? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and it was, li it was uh, live to tape, probably, then? Uh, it was already tape. Right. Uh, the TV that I did in New York between uh, 1947 and 1951 was all live. It was wonderful. Craft Theater, Studio One, 
Robert Montgomery Presents, these were all one-hour plays, and they were live. And so you rehearsed for 10 days, then you did a dress rehearsal in the morning or afternoon, and then you did the play. And how many cameras would they shoot with? Usually three or four. And would they shoot in a studio or would they shoot in a theater? No, in a studio, and you went from one set to the other set, to another set, and uh, during the commercial, which was also live on the side, you moved, and the cameras moved to the next set. So you had a rehearsal for not only for the play and the acting, you had a rehearsal for our, the commercial breaks to move between your sets? Yeah. It was great. Wow. I and did, if uh, there was a flub, what happened? That's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any uh, disasters? There was one. Uh, I did a Robert Montgomery Presents with Lon Chaney, Jr. Uh, <clears throat> And he was quite wonderful, but uh, he was scared and nervous the whole time. And during the shooting, uh, the door got <laughs> stuck a little, and he said, someone fix the door. But we were, of course, <laughs> but we went on and on. That was the only <laughs> he was. He was quite wonderful. He, I liked working with him. And I did one for a craft with uh, Jimmy Dean, who was also nervous, because he had never done theater. Right. But he wasn't yet a movie actor. It was just the beginning of he was going to move into, into movies. And what part Sweet did you do man. with Jimmy Dean? Uh, he that was a romantic. Uh, he was. Uh, uh, a street guy, and I was a little bit from the middle class. <laughs> anyway, it was a, a story. I don't remember the details. So wait a minute. You played a romantic part with James Dean? Yeah, on the TV show. On the TV show? On the TV show. I'm going to say that again. You played a romantic part with James Dean? Yeah. Wow. He was a sweet, sweet, very shy actor and very shy man. Uh, young man. And shortly after that, he right. became a big star. And what was it like to work in New York? Um, I mean, uh, my experience is only, you know, the smaller places like Toronto or Winnipeg or Montreal, but New York was one of the centers of the universe, so to speak. Well, <clears throat> I started in radio, uh, which to this day I think is wonderful. Um, I did 109 auditions before I got my first job in radio. And as soon as I got my first job, I worked forever. Uh, <clears throat> I auditioned in, uh, for what uh, was called the Red Network, which was NBC, and the Blue Network, which was ABC. And I did an audition in the morning for a director who came out and said, what makes you think you can act, Miss Douglas? And I said, thank you very much, and went out. And there were quite a few other actors. We were all auditioning one after the other, one of whom was Kirk Douglas, and uh, who very shortly after that became a big actor. And they all said to me, we were all auditioning in the afternoon for, for the Blue Network. And they all, I told them what happened, and they said, are you going to do the afternoon one? And I said, listen, I've waited for months. I'm going to do the afternoon one. And uh, in the afternoon, the director was Homer Fickett, who was the director of the Theatre Guild of the Air, the most prestigious radio show. And I did the same material. I'm sure no better than <laughs> the morning. And he came out and he said, are you free starting next Thursday? <laughs> I said, yes. And he said, I'd like you to play Beth in Little Women 
with Katherine Hepburn. So? I cannot tell you how many <laughs> Theatre Guild of the Air I did for him. Uh, I did um, Payment Deferred with Charles Lawton, and I did uh, Barclay Square with Rex Harrison, and I did, um, uh, I did a lot. I worked for him a lot. And Catherine Hepburn, what was she like to work oh, with? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And Just you pl played sisters or? <coughs> uh, little Women, she played Joe. They're five sisters. I played Beth, the one that dies. Uh, for those who know the play Little Women, they will know. 